Is that the end of the story? Not quite. One amplifier will not necessarily do everything you need. If you're running a full monitor system, for instance, you'll probably want to use a separate amp channel to power it. Also, if you're running a multiple speaker setup, like main speakers plus subwoofers, you'll need separate amplification for each, plus another piece of equipment called a crossover. A crossover is a series of filters that splits a full range signal into different frequency bands that loudspeakers are designed to reproduce. Some loudspeaker units have what's called a passive crossover, already built into them, and that distributes its signals to its low and high frequency drivers and horns respectively. And we'll look at these more closely in the loudspeaker scene. An active crossover, on the other hand, as its name implies, gives you control over the frequency ranges that are being sent to each of the components. In other words, your subwoofers just get the lows, and your mains just the mids and highs. Some amplifiers, like the Yamaha P-Series, have an active crossover built in. This kind of saves both money and cabling hassles. Here on the Yamaha P3500S, you can see these crossover style filtering controls at the back. Amplifiers don't produce power. They convert power from an AC outlet. High-powered amplifiers can draw large amounts of AC power, so be sure to use heavy cabling and avoid power strips as these will limit the amount of current available to the amplifier. Make sure amplifiers don't overheat and that they have plenty of ventilation. Remember, heat is enemy number one for power amplifiers. Drive amps hard, but not to the max. Professional power amplifiers are made to deliver a very high output. An occasional clip light flashing is your indication that you've reached that maximum output of the amplifier. Distortion damages. Damages your speakers, your ears, and is pretty hard on the audience's ears as well. Avoid this by controlling your maximum output levels. Don't skimp on cabling. Use large gauge wiring to assure that all the power the amplifier provides actually goes to the loudspeaker. You should also eliminate excessive extra length. If your cables are too long, you're wasting some of that power that could be getting to the loudspeaker. We always try to minimize the amount of cable between the speaker and the amplifier because they sound better. There's no reason to waste your amplifier power heating up the copper in the cable. You want to basically get your amplifiers as close to the speakers as you can. Sometimes when you can't, you need to use the one that seats, but anytime you can use the 5 or the 10 footers, it's really the best thing to do. EQ is short for equalization, a term and a technique that sprang out of the early telephone industry, where the technology affected certain frequencies in a voice, and a way of returning those frequencies to their more natural, equal state became necessary. Strangely enough, although a whole industry has grown up around equalization and sound reinforcement, it's still quite helpful to keep in mind this original purpose, to make electronically delivered sound more natural and more lifelike. At its simplest, EQ is just treble and bass controls, like you'd find on a basic home stereo system. Here on the MG164 mixer, these tone controls have slightly more sophisticated names, high and low, along with control over mid. These names refer to a particular range of audio frequencies, and the knobs let you boost or cut the level of high, low or mid range frequencies that are present in any sound going through the channel, so altering the tonal characteristics. Actually, these knobs control filters that let certain frequencies in a sound pass through unaffected, while homing in on other frequencies and allowing you to make them louder or softer. It may seem obvious, but one of the first lessons to learn about EQ is that not all frequencies are present in every sound. Sure, you can hear the changes to a guitar when we adjust the high EQ, but apply the same changes to a bass or a kick drum and there's not that much difference because neither of these sounds contain many high frequencies in the first place. Lesson, you can only boost or cut frequencies that are actually contained in the sound. There aren't too many EQ parameters to remember or learn about. There's the choice of the frequency itself, then there's how much you boost or cut that frequency, and in more elaborate consoles you'll find a Q control, which varies how wide or narrow the band of frequencies the EQ will affect. 
We've seen and heard how cutting or boosting high, mid or low frequencies on the MG16-4 affects different sounds. And while this EQ is good, here you are limited to the particular frequency that the designers have designated as high, mid or low. In other words, you can't change them on this mixer, and nor can you change how narrow or broad the tonal adjustment is going to be. If you need more precise EQ control, you'll want to use an external device such as this, a graphic equaliser, or this, a parametric equaliser. A graphic equaliser allows you to cut or boost very narrow frequency ranges. Say your sound system, combined with the venue you're playing in, has an unpleasant ring to it. A graphic equaliser makes it easy to find that specific frequency, and then adjust it down a little to get rid of it and doing this without affecting the sound of other instruments and voices that you're reinforcing. Well, how do you find the offending frequency? Oddly enough, the best way is to first try and make the ring worse to confirm the problem, and then make your adjustment. Boost the frequency levels until you can isolate what's causing the problem. Then when you cut that particular frequency, you eliminate the problem. Most digital stereo systems nowadays have settings that the manufacturer has decided are good for specific types of music, a rock setting or a classical setting. For rock and hip-hop, you probably want the overall sound to feel powerful and loud. And EQ can help you achieve this by adding some boost to the lowest frequencies. A typical graphic equaliser setting would be what's called a smile, i.e. boosting both the low and the high end in a gradual natural curve. The most sophisticated type of EQ device is this, what's called a parametric equaliser. Like the graphic equaliser, you can select different frequencies to operate on, but you can also change the focus or width the frequency is being altered. This additional parameter, hence the name, is called the Q, and it can be set to narrow, a high numeric value, where the focus is very specific to a certain range of frequencies, or wide, a low number where the adjustment will also take in a fairly broad range of frequencies on either side. This is the most accurate type of equaliser, but its operation is quite a bit more complex and you'll need to practice to learn how to use these filters properly. Here are a few tips to help you avoid some of the common mistakes when it comes to using EQ. 1. EQ is a practiced art, not a science. Time and careful listening can make you an expert. Learn to listen with your eyes, that is scan the stage with your eyes while listening carefully to make sure that you can hear all the instruments and the voices that you're seeing. 2. Follow the rule, he who EQs least, EQs best. Before you start twisting EQ controls to fix the sound, make sure to check that the microphone and microphones are positioned properly and that you have the right type for the sounds that you want to amplify. Often. This will go way further than all the knob twisting in the world. 3. Keep in mind that EQ adjustments you make need to be made in the context of the overall mix. In other words, sometimes you need to make adjustments to create space so that all the instruments can be heard. A good example of this is that a guitar might need to be EQ'd in order to leave room for a vocalist. They both use the same relative frequencies, and so adjusting the EQ to thin the guitar would actually help the vocals. 4. Before you make drastic EQ changes to your overall sound, walk around the venue to see if the problem occurs everywhere, or just where you happen to have the mixer set up. Not only will this help you hear what the audience is hearing, it also shows the performers that you're willing to make the extra effort to get the sound perfect. If, during the performance, you experience the ringing mentioned before, you are being warned that you've reached a point called maximum acoustic gain meaning that you cannot increase the volume any further in the system. You need to decrease the output level of the system until the ringing, which is obviously a big distraction to your audience, subsides, and then work on the problem later without the audience. The only thing more distracting than the ringing is you trying to fix it. You may have too many microphones turned on, improperly aimed, or simply the wrong mic for the job. Check it out after the performance. Hey, 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 one, two, that's good. If you put a mic in front of a singer and simply record it, or put it straight through your sound reinforcement system, that's what's called a raw, unprocessed signal. 
but there's lots you can do to both colour and process that signal before the audience actually gets to hear it. You can get rid of unwanted background noise, you can add reverb to it, make it punchier, add some echo, maybe even make it sound like it's been generated by a synthesizer. All such things we tend to lump under the heading of adding effects. Effects are tools. Sometimes you'll find a range of them built into the mixer. Sometimes you'll need to purchase and plug in a specific effects processor. Effects can broadly be divided up into two categories. Signal controlling effects and signal processing effects. And in fact, signal processing can be further divided up into special effects and spatial effects.